Hey everyone, welcome back to the other side of weight loss. My guest today is the lovely Jennifer Luddington from fitlud.com. She is a recovering exercise and physique addict who is now a fitness and healthy lifestyle coach. After battling years of over-exercising, eating disorders, and obsession obsessions, she understands firsthand how you can break free and transform your fitness and health to become more than just your body. So welcome, Jennifer. Hey, what's going on, Karen? Thank you for having me. This is the second time Jennifer and I have got to chat in the last few weeks because she is doing an incredible summit that I would love you to just share with everyone what the summit's all about because all every single one of these listeners needs to join the yeah. summit so that they can yeah. take part of this. So tell us a little bit about the summit first. Oh, you're so sweet. Thank you. Yeah. Karen, I'm stoked that you're speaking as an expert. Yes. On the panel. Me like, too. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm really passionate about helping women kind of end the yo-yo diet cycle, right? Like gaining 10 pounds, losing 10 pounds back and forth, yo-yo dieting. It's like miserable. I mean, it still is your joy, still is moments of your life. So I put together this amazing summit and it's an online summit with over 23 speakers now experts in the industry who are going to be sharing for free, you know, their knowledge and on how to help people lose weight for life in a sustainable, healthy way. Um, and it is focused on women's health specifically, mm -hmm. you know, women's goals, what we struggle with, what we battle with. So yeah, it's going to launch on the 24th. Amazing. So I'll put the link to that so you guys can register um, in the show notes. So I, after hearing Jennifer's story, I wanted her to come on this podcast because she has a story that I think can relate to a lot of women. Mm -hmm. Jennifer at one time owned a yoga studio, a gym. She was an extreme fitness competitor for nine years. Is that correct? Right? Nine years, yeah. Jennifer? Yes. Um, and looked, I think, Jennifer, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it was really, you were looking like you had it all. You had the body, you had the gym, you had all of this going on for you. But what was really going on behind those closed doors? <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you for that. I appreciate it, Karen. But I'm going to back up just a little bit because I think yeah. the context of this is kind of important. So people think, I mean, I've been in the industry for almost 14 years, right? So people kind of think that I was inherently like this athlete and that I've always been like fit. And that's completely untrue. I really wanted to be an attorney, <laughs> right? Oh, so, wow. Um, I didn't go looking for fitness. Like it found me and it found me out of desperation. And, um, I was in a really bad marriage. Like I was young and, um, I was in a really, it was abusive. It was kind of a, just a really sh crappy situation. And, you know, I, I found fitness because I needed something to help empower me. Right. I found fitness because I needed something to help me get stronger. And I realized that when I started picking up heavy objects, it also helped me pick myself up. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, and so I started, I started working out. I started to really pay attention to my own physical fitness and I started to gain strength and it started to kind of translate into all these other areas of my life. And it gave me the strength to leave my ex-husband with a baby on my hip. She was under a year old. Wow. Um, and I was a trainer at Gold's Gym at the time. And, um, I was getting all my certifications, doing all that stuff. And uh, A2O Fitness is a gym that I founded, and it kind of fell in my lap. Um, and I started, I grew it, and it exploded. It was crazy. Like, and I found that my gifts and my talents were allowing women to come into my space and showing them that by empowering themselves through lifting weights and getting physically fit, they could empower themselves in every aspect of their life. And that was something that I felt really connected and aligned with. Um, so that's what I did for a long time. And what happened through that transition, Karen, was really kind of dark. It became, it became completely opposite of why I even started. Oh, okay. Yeah, right. Um, I was, you know, all of a sudden at the top of my game in the industry, I, I felt like I had to keep striving to keep looking a certain way. I felt like I had to match up to all the fitness models out there. I started fitness modeling. I started competing. And I just started getting sucked into attaching my worth as a person to my physical appearance. Mm -hmm. And they were so closely connected that I became stricken with massive 
of session beyond a lot of <laughs> real recognition. I mean, it was insane. And I was still standing on stages, you know, every month I was competing nationally. I was opening gyms. I was creating my own nutrition bar company. I was raising my daughter. Everything looked beautiful on the outside. But I was insanely striving to contain this, to, to create this image. And I felt like if I took a step back at all, I would fall on my face and I'd be worth nothing because I didn't look a certain way. Mm -hmm. um, so I suffered in silence, literally did not tell anyone. No one knew for six years in this space. And, um, you know, in those moments when it, the darkest moments, and I, I tell the story a lot and I actually want to share it with your audience because this part of my story is so powerful because there was a moment I remember, um, this was when I had my breakdown and I had to know, I knew I had to get out of it. <clears throat> I was, it was Christmas time. And I remember it was Christmas time because it was, it was, I could see the lights from the Christmas tree and I didn't want to turn on the lights in the middle of the night because I didn't want to wake anybody up. But I was laying in bed starving and shivering. I was so deeply hungry and I, I was shivering because I, I had no fat on my body. I was starving. And Karen, I'll tell you the story. It's hard for me to tell still. I might get choked up, but I remember creeping through the house and being thankful that the Christmas tree lights, I'm sorry, I didn't have to turn on the lights. And also knowing that I didn't want anyone to hear me open the silverware drawer. I didn't want to have that shuffle in the silverware drawer. And I knew what I was going to do. I knew I had to eat, but I knew I didn't want to intake those calories, right? I knew. Yeah. So I remember going into the cupboard, into the pantry and standing in the pantry with a jar of Adam's peanut butter. And literally, this, is, this, is, this was the mentality of me. I was scooping peanut butter out of this jar. And all I could taste was salt because I was crying uncontrollably uh -huh. because I knew in that moment that even though I needed the food, I was so starving. I was going to go purge oh. it came into my body. So I would go through these cycles of massive restriction to get so starving that I would binge and then purge and then over exercise the next day. And it was this vicious cycle that continued for a long time. And it continued as I was standing on stages and winning titles. Mm -hmm. and, it, and I saw other women doing the same thing and it was all okay. It was almost like it was okay that we all had these obsessive compulsive eating disorders and this obsession around exercise. It was almost like a big deal. Yeah. You could support each other because you're all there doing the same thing. So then it kind of makes it seem like it's okay. It was insane. And so I knew, um, you know, about that was about four years ago when I had to pull myself out of it, but I realized I was a part of the problem. Mm -hmm. Like I realized I'm perpetuating these unrealistic, unattainable, unsustainable images to the, to the entire society or diet culture because I'm walking around with these shredded abs and I'm ripped all the time and I look fitness perfect. But really, I'm losing my hair. My thyroid is completely gone. I haven't had a cycle in six years. Um, my hormones are shot. My pituitary gland was shot. Um, I couldn't function without thyroid medication. I couldn't get off the couch at 3 p.m. Um, I had to have extensions because my hair fell out, eyelash extensions. Um, wow. it, was, it was insane. And so the picture of fitness that women are looking at is really not maintainable, healthy, or sustainable. And it's really just an unauthentic version of what people think fitness is. And yeah. so my mission now is to be part of the solution, right? It's to share that story with women so they understand the other side of those glossy images. They understand that scroll on Instagram is really not the truth. Mm -hmm. I'm firsthand here to tell you. Mm -hmm. um, and so I really wanted to make sure that I was a voice for that in my business and instead of a voice on the other side. Mm -hmm. How did we get so far off from what a woman should really look like. Like you would think that we wouldn't be so fooled. I mean, how many people do you know with that perfect physique that isn't doing what you were doing? Like nobody, like unless they're just like that rare genetic superior person that like I have one girlfriend I can think of, of all my friends that I think is like genetically superior who just looks like she's had four children. You would not one stretch mark. She has a flat stomach. She's like, no, she looks amazing. And she's 43. You know, it's like one person, right? Like we're so misconceived. Oh, it's crazy. The misconception that we all have of what 
is that we could actually think that we can look like that without really damaging ourselves. So can you tell us a little bit, even what it took for you to look like that? Like what, how much were you working out? What were you eating in a day? Yeah. So this is um, such an interesting question because I've, I've answered it, but I'm going to, I mean, I've answered it before with people, but I, I really want people to understand. I used to justify mm-hmm. that. I, I would literally justify, okay, well I'm eating five times a day, so I'm not anorexic. Right. So that I was eating half a can of tuna and lettuce yeah. or, you know, this much tilapia and, and, and a, an asparagus sphere. Wow. Right. But yeah. in my head, I was able to say, well, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm eating five times a day. I'm not anorexic. That was my mentality, Karen. And so, um, I, I have a pretty genetically good physique. I mean, I'm just going to say it, it really is not. Yeah, like, you do. You look great. Not, Thank you. But I mean, it's like, I did have that going for me to start. So, um, but what I would do on a daily basis, there was a time where I remember, I remember they got to the point where I wouldn't go out with friends. Um, I would avoid social situations. I would actually, I remember there was one time I have to say, this was one of the moments that I knew it was bad. My daughter had a ballet practice and it was, it was really important to her. It makes me cry thinking about it, but it was really important to her. And I knew it was important to her, but I had to get my cardio in. Oh. I was getting on stage the next week. And I remember this moment because I missed her practice. I missed my beautiful, angelic daughter's ballet practice because my mind was so addicted to the physique that I had to get my hour of cardio in. So instead of going and staying at her practice or her ballet practice, I went next door to Gold's gym and got on the stair climber and left her there to practice without being able to see her beautiful performance that she was getting ready for. Wow. So these are the moments that I missed in my life. That, and when I say it stole my joy and dimmed my life, I was so obsessed into this addictive state over this physique that I lost moments that I would never, ever get back. And mm-hmm. that is my biggest regret. So when you ask me what I did on a daily basis, mm-hmm. it, was, it was morning cardio, it was a lift, it was probably hot yoga at some point during there, and then an evening cardio. Oh, wow. So when I say I was exercising for three to four hours a day, that's not an exaggeration, it's actually yeah. an honest truth. So if you can think about that as me trying to run gyms, a staff, being a single mom, right? And um, having a protein bar company that I, that I created myself and the yoga studio, all these things and still doing that. I mean, this is an insane time, mm-hmm. right? Just to maintain this image. Right. Yep. Yeah. Oh, wow. Oh my gosh. And you know, what's so sad is I, when you're talking, I remember thinking in my twenties, how badly I wish I could work out like that. Like I remember thinking, Oh, I just need to work out like two to three hours a day. If I went in the morning and I went at night, I didn't, I just didn't have the stamina to, stamina to do it. But I thought in my head always, that's what I needed to do to have, to have the body like you. Like, and that, that to me was normal. I was like, this is what I have to do. I need to work out. I need to eat the cans of tuna with salad. Like, I just couldn't ever do it. <laughs> Good. Well, I'm glad you could. I no, I was doing far more reckless things than that. I was destroying my body in a totally different way <laughs> in my twenties. I did my own damage. So <laughs> but it was, it was a bright, shiny object. It was a big facade and I, I, um, I hid behind it real well. Right. I, and I justified it. So like you said, two hours a day. Oh, well, it's my job. It's your job, yes. It's your yes. job. It's not, don't, it's, it's, everything's okay. It's my job. Yeah. Um, and, and that was my other way. You know, I, I told myself I was an anorexic because I was eating, and I told myself it was okay because it was my job. But, you know, the human brain has all these ways to, to rationalize and justify. Right? Yeah, yeah. And you, you know, you said something, Andrew, you said, I was addicted. Mm. And you really were. I mean, we, mm. when we're, we're in that state, you're even in your head, you were so addicted and going down those pathways that you had, you know, the neurological pathways inside your brain that was like, this is what you had to do. This is what you had to eat. You had to keep up this image. How did you break out of that? Because like any addiction to break an addiction of identity 
is probably one of the most challenging things there. That's why it's so hard to change. And I know I have had a number of clients who were at the, where you are and they were heavy actually because of it. I've had a couple of women that they come to me for weight loss and they're working out like crazy and barely eating and they're not able to lose weight. But anyways, their addiction, I can tell how addicted they are to it and how they will not, they will, they were not willing to give up the exercise part of it, even though that was what was destroying them. How did you break from that? Yeah, that's a really good question. So as you're asking me that, I'm thinking about, you know, there was a long process. Of course, I had my own team of coaches and help, but originally, you know, how I still, how I still break through that is there's, there's two things. There's one, people always say that you need to break a habit. I just think you need to modify a habit. So it's much easier to modify something that you're already doing than to just stop doing it. Right. right. Because do, you know, people always say, just stop doing it. That, that's really not, no, it doesn't work. No, <laughs> I always say you have to replace one addiction with another one, but just a healthier one. Right. Yes. Yeah. So I had in my, for, you know, 10 years of my life, you know, my schedule was, I do this at this time. I do this at this time. I exercise here. So I had to modify them, not change them. So I had to start giving myself permission to lean into softening around it. And what I mean by that is, okay, so here's my habit. I get up every day at 6 a.m. and I work out. So now my habit is going to be replacing that with something else. Now I'm going to walk. I'm going to take my dogs for a walk early in the morning and meditate. So I had to, or, you know, I ate five times a day. So instead of eating five times a day and just having salad and tuna, I had to ease into it. So instead I had salad, tuna, and an avocado right? Instead of having, I didn't quit cold turkey. It wasn't like all or nothing. All of a sudden I'm done. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Bring on the cheeseburger. I'm going to sit on my couch yeah, now. Yeah. Yeah, right? <laughs> no, I can't window. imagine. Yeah. Yeah. I had to ease my window. So I replaced those habits. I modified those habits instead of, you know, throwing them out the window or breaking them. I just modified them. And then the other thing I did is I had to get really mindful. I had to get present because I hadn't been, I didn't even know where I was half the time. I was so obsessed that I was like on this, you know, this train where I didn't, the same day was the same day was the same day. I mean, all the thoughts I had yesterday were the same thoughts I was having today. So I had to start reframing that and get present. And so I had to start bringing my, cause I was avoiding all this emotional baggage, right? I was avoiding all of this stuff by, you know, being mindless. Mm -hmm. So I had to learn to be mindful. Mm -hmm. And the way that I learned to do that was, and, and you know, everyone's going to a lot of this is meditation, but this is what I want to say about meditation. I had to start getting, doing meditation, but the way I did meditation was different. I started with moving meditation. So I would go outside and I would walk for 10 minutes and I would make myself stay in my walk and not think about tomorrow, not think about what's going to happen, not think about what happened yesterday. I would make myself stay in my walk. And pretty soon I was able to be more present and mindful in all of my choices, right? And I was able to pause, whereas before it was automatic. I would just go to that train of thought, that way of being. So now I gave myself permission to pause. Say, okay, what is really going on? Why do I really feel like I need to go hit it hard in the gym? What am I running from? And I was finally able to hit pause long enough to instead of going back on those repeat thoughts from yesterday and the days before and the old stories that I was telling myself, I was able to recreate a new story by pausing. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's precious moments in that pause. And if our society would learn to slow down and hit pause every once in a while, that will help break all of those old stories, which in turn will help break those bad habits and modify them into something you know, better for us. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, we as humans don't change easily, as we said before, it's hard to break these addictions and we usually need leverage. We need something that either you got to hit rock bottom and that's going to look different for everybody. But was there something that made you like, was it your daughter? Was it your health? Was it? Yeah. Okay. So it wasn't me. No, I, no, it rarely is. Unless you're being told that you'd like, unless you have a heart attack or you're on your deathbed. And then it's like the doctor says, you got to smarten up. Then people are like, Oh, okay. Now I'll smarten up. But most of the time it has to be, yeah, somebody else. Was not me. Yeah. So your uh, moms will get this. And I'm sure there's a lot of moms listening. <clears throat> She's my wife. 
she's my wife. She's my wife. So there's two, the, the moment four years ago, I remember it clear as day. It wasn't money. It wasn't me. It wasn't my health. It wasn't anything. It was something very simple, but so it hit me straight to my core. She was my daughter, my beautiful little seven-year-old daughter, she looked at me and she said, mommy, are you ever going to eat anything other than lettuce? Oh yeah. <laughs> so it still chokes me up because yeah. in that moment I realized that I was, Harry was trying to teach my daughter this healthy way of life. Like I'm trying, she's raised in my gym with me, right? She's raised on my head. I mean, she could probably train clients better than most, but <laughs> you know, here she is day after day, five in the morning on my head. And I'm showing her how to, you know, be physically active, how to eat healthy. But all she sees is mom eating nothing but lettuce in her little tiny body. So what am I teaching my child? What am I doing to my child? What kind of disorders and eating disorders am I creating in my precious, innocent child? And in and, and that moment, I knew, okay, something has to give. Something has to give. And so that was the big one for me. And then most recently, and I'll be very vulnerable and share about this, you know, it's again my daughter, but you know, my daughter's father recently passed. And so as a mom, it's like she, we're, that she, I'm her person. Right? I'm her person. So I can't, how could I slip? I can't go back down that road again. She needs me. And the audience is, that's listening right now, there's people in your life that need you. You need to show up for yourself and be honest with yourself about what you're doing for your health and your wellness. Because if you're not showing up for you, there is no possible way you can show up in the best capacity for them. And so that's what I try to teach women is that women have this misconception about Oh, it's selfish. I'm going to go to the gym and I'm, I'm going to, it's not selfish. It's, it's necessary for you to be your healthiest person and to take care of your nutrition and your wellness and your spirituality and you as a human so that you can take care of them. Yeah. Um, and so that's what it was. It wasn't me. It was her. Yeah. And I think it's important for the women listening, no matter what challenge you're being faced with right now, that is such a key point of if you if you want to change something if you want to change your body or anything else that's in your life find that leverage and a lot of the time it is our kids i know for myself i same kind of it makes me cry when i think about it but and it wasn't about my body but i remember very clearly lying on my kitchen floor hyper like totally hyperventilating crying and my daughter who was one at the time crawling around next to me and me looking at her and seeing and it was all about because I, I had to break up with the love of my life and I was devastated that another relationship had failed. And I looked at my daughter and I knew instantaneously, I had this like flash of her future. And I thought, if I don't change this, she will have the exact same issues when she's older. And I knew it. I could see that she would walk in my footsteps and just have one failed relationship after the other. And all the stuff that I went through, she was going to have to go through to some degree. Yeah. And right in that instant, I knew I had to change it. And I did. And now I'm married to that guy that I broke up with that was making me lie on the floor crying my eyes out. But two years later, which is kind of funny, but yes, we had both changed. But we, as people, I had to go away and heal and change. And I had my own coaches and my own therapy. And I was a completely different person. And so is he. And now we're in this beautiful relationship for the last eight years. And she has been able to see. And she can't imagine anything else but this amazing, solid relationship with two people respecting each other. And it's like, it was that, it was her. Or else I would have kept doing the exact same thing. I also quit drinking for her. I just, I just did not want her to follow in my footsteps. And so those that are listening, if you have children and you need some leverage to make the change, really think about what you're teaching your kids. I think that that's very powerful. I agree with you 100%. And I think that, you know, in order to have a, a motivation is wavering, right? I mean, I'm gonna, oh, this, yes, totally. And this is going to tie back into what you just said, but motivation is wavering. And so I get women all the time and they say, I want to lose 10 pounds. I, I want to go on vacation. I, I can't stand that. Like I, that is not a big enough why for me yep. because change only happens. And I am a firm believer in this change only happens with that emotional connection to the motivation. So if your why is 10 pounds because you want to get in a bikini, girl, I'm telling you, it's not going to happen. And if it does happen, it's going to come right back 
on. So the key to the sustainability is to really tie yourself into your why. It's like you've got to get deep with yourself. You've got to understand why you really want this. And I guarantee you it's an emotional connection to something bigger than yourself. Yeah. And so for me, I always coach women on let's really find out why you really want this, why you really want to live this life. And then once we can tie your goal to that emotion, you're unstoppable. Yeah. And you have to remind yourself of that every day. And every day I wake up and I remind myself of my why. It's so much bigger than this, my bikini and what size jeans I'm going to put on. It's not enough. It's not enough. It will not sustain your goals. So if you can focus on the bigger picture and get a 30,000 foot view, right? And look at the people around you that really rely on you to be your best self. There's your why. There's your one. You can connect with that. Believe me, weight loss will feel, and, and, and then it feels so ridiculous when you make excuses. Like, really? Yeah. Like, I mean, I mean, how obscene is, how, like, what a big ego I have, right? When I'm, I have a little anxiety about going to the gym or I'm a little bit fearful of what people will think. Really? Like, I'm trying to get healthy for myself so I can be there for my kids. Like, then your excuses get a little bit squashed. Yeah, yeah. It's right? just, it's the same thing, like, oh, I'm going to teach you how to be healthy. And it's like, that's not enough for people. A woman's not going to be like, I'm going to lose the 20 pounds. I just want to feel healthy. It's like, no, that doesn't work. That's not enough. I always say, find your why and then go down that road of what will happen if you don't make that change and get deep with it. Like yeah. what is the worst case scenario of if you don't lose that weight, what's going to happen to your kids? Are your kids going to have that struggle now for the rest of their life? Or if you don't leave that relationship, the abusive relationship, or for me, just the wrong relationship at the time, like what's going to happen if you don't leave it? What kind of person are you going to become in two years, five years, 10 years, if you don't make this change? That's and huge. Get honest. And get honest. honest. Totally. Like, people think, oh, I'm just, you know, my blood pressure's a little high or I'm, yeah. No, no, get like I, I get all the self love stuff. Like I get all the positive self talk. Like I'm big on that. Belief. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but like, really, like, okay, if you're overweight, like, don't just call it that. Like, look at really what's happening. Don't you know fluff it. The fluff right. is not going to serve you. Like, get real with yourself and say, hey, I'm 50 pounds overweight. This is going to impact my health. Like, I could end up in the hospital. Right. Yeah. Yes. Like, yeah. Like, Type two diabetes. I could get a limb taken off. This is very realistic. Seriously, this happens. It's not just other people, right? No. It's like dive in and get real with yourself. And then, and, and once you connect to that, like you said about what's, what could happen, yeah, it's probably a pretty good chance it will happen. It's just a matter of time. So it's like, and then what happens? Then what happens to your family? What happens to the people that take care of you? What, what burdens have you put on them? Because you are ta not able to get honest with yourself and stop making excuses. So I'm very, I have like very compassionate, tough love with my clients. Like I'm all about love and, and giving you nurturing advice, but I'm also about honesty. Like, yeah. you know, this world is full of like that fluff. And I, sometimes you just, you need to be honest. <laughs> Yeah. And you talk a lot about too, about like slaying your dragons, about like past trauma, like old stuff and how important that is to look at. Can you speak about that a little bit? Yeah. I love that term. Um, I love it too. Uh, and the, it really resonates with me because I think people band-aid a lot and they want to band-aid all their problems. They want to just put a quick fix on it, move around and go to the next thing. But what happens is when you're band-aiding things, when you're not actually dealing with the honest truth of the reality of what is in front of you, you know, what happens is you keep getting burned by those flames. That dragon just keeps coming out of the dungeon and it shows up in the worst times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but until you really start to dive into that and you really start to face all the things, the past stories that are still coming up for you, that still rule your life, that still come into your mindset every day. You know, until you really start to look at it and push pause, you know, you're still going to be pushing that dragon back into the dungeon over and over again the rest of your life. Whereas if you can really just stop, pause, and for once and for all, just say, I'm going to look at this honestly. Right? I'm going to look at this. I'm going to be present with it. I'm going to understand that maybe when I want to go for that cookie, maybe I'm really just trying to avoid. Maybe I'm really trying to numb. Maybe I'm really trying to not feel what's coming up. 
because in our culture, we're taught to just push it aside and just strive on and pick, pick yourself up from your bootstraps and, you know, put a smile on your face. Yet sometimes it's okay to just allow that emotion to come in. It doesn't mean you have to embody it. It just means you can allow it to come in, say, hey, okay, I feel this, and allow it to pass. Because if you It's a 90 second emotion, like emotions pass, right? So instead of going for the cookie, if you can just let yourself be with that uncomfort, that discomfort feeling, either maybe it's loneliness, maybe it's sadness, maybe it's grief, if you can just let yourself feel it and know that it's not you, right? It's not, you're not an angry person, you're not a lonely person, you're just feeling angry, you're feeling lonely. And let that pass, instead of going for the cookie, you start to create that habit, that press pause, and get comfortable and the uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. yep. And that's when you slay the dragons. That's when you get past that for life, right? Yeah, absolutely. And as a fitness coach, which is what you do now, you told me prior to this uh, getting on air that you don't actually work with women in that in the competition realm anymore. So for those listening, I would love for you to share what is healthy fitness then? Like what yeah. level should we, if, if I was coming to you as a client, what would you tell me is a healthy amount of fitness? And I'm, I'm sure it's not the two, three hours that you were doing before, what is it? I love this question because I was actually just speaking about it on my, I do a live in my group every day. We're talking about the flow and force of fitness. And the flow and force of fitness, so it's internal versus external. So let me dive into that for just a second. So bear with me. So fitness is about sustaining being able to sustain a role that you want in your life. That's what fitness is, okay? So you have to first figure out what the role is you wanna sustain in your life. So my role is I wanna be healthy for my kids, I wanna be able to run and jump with them, I wanna be able to adventure with my husband, that's what I wanna do. So now your fitness has to align with the role that you wanna sustain in your life, okay? So when you're scrolling through Instagram, you're getting all this external <laughs> input. Oh, in order to be fit, you've got to look like a CrossFitter. You've got to have I was going to say that. I'm like, I, I scrolled the Instagram CrossFitter women all the time. And I'm like, God, I want to look like that so badly. But I realize now they're all on steroids. So <laughs> <laughs> the ones that I'm looking at, they, they're, yeah. they're not on steroids. <laughs> it's crazy. So yeah. is that the role you want to sustain in your life? It's not. <laughs> okay. So let's back into that. So take the external out. Take the external out. Go internally. Figure out what your internal wisdom is on what role you want to sustain in your life, okay? So the way that I do that is, does this feel good to me? Does this make me excited to go do it? Do I feel aligned when I'm doing this? Do I feel like I'm helping my body and nurturing myself, right? So what I do is I ask people to say this. Okay, listen, it's really important for you to show up. Like, you've got to just keep showing up. But let's give you some freedom around your fitness, meaning... Let's just say we set a time every day that you create space for fitness, but give yourself the freedom to flow with it. Meaning don't force, I work out, I lift Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and then I do yoga on Friday. No, give yourself the committable, that time you can commit irrevocably to showing up for your fitness, but give yourself the space to lean in to whatever feels best for you that day. So for me, I work out every day at 8.30 a.m. That's what I do. But it's not always a lift. It's not always yoga. It's, it's sometimes it's a walk. Sometimes I feel terrible and I just stretch, but I show up. I never miss it because it strengthens my resolve. It strengthens my confidence in myself that I know I can show up no matter what, but I give myself the freedom to flow in that. So to answer your question, first identify how, what role you want to show up for in your life. And then say, okay, if I just want to be able to hike and bike and I just want to be able to feel good, great. Create some space in your life three to four days a week that you always show up and do what feels best for you in that role. Yeah. Make sense? Oh, I love it. I love it. Because also I think that that would just help somebody to get the motivation just to go. Because if you have that agreement with yourself, it's, you know, in the morning you're like, oh, I really don't feel like working out today. And we all have these excuses. If you could just be like, you know what, we're just going to show up. 
if all I do is walk on the treadmill for half an hour, then that's fine. Because more than likely, once you're there, you get going, you'll actually have a good workout in most cases. Yeah. But I do that. I'll go to like, if I'm like PMSing, I'll be like, oh, you know what? I can't lift weights today. Yeah. I'm going to go to yoga this morning instead. Yeah. And I'll do that. And it feels so good. Yeah. And it just the pressure off of it, right? Yes. And no one's, I mean, you guys listen, like I'm almost 40. Like I'm not going to go and try to be like a 24, like 24 year old fitness model on Instagram. That's not the role I want in my life. Right? Like, so stop trying to strive for that. It's so yeah. unnecessary. Yeah. And so just get into the space of what's going to serve you the best of your life and then work backwards. Right? Yeah. Fitness is different for everyone and, and go internal. Stop using the external cues. Internal wisdom is key. Yeah. I say the same thing about losing weight. I say this to my clients all the time, which is, I'll say, what number, you know, would you let, want to get to, right? And they always have some ridiculously low number. And I was there once too, where I was like, 125, that's where I want to be, 125. And and one day I realized when I was at like the 128 mark and I'd been there for a year and I was still striving for this number, ridiculous number in my head. And I was like, am I willing to do what it takes for me to get to 125? Cause my body doesn't like to go underneath 128. So am I willing to eat less, work out more, put my body in, in more harm's way, right? With my hormones and everything else. And it was like, no, I have food freedom right now. I don't have to work out like crazy. I'm really happy and I can maintain this. Yeah. No problem. I love that. And I, yeah. I also think that like we get, and I just want to touch on one more thing, Karen, sure. I think it's really important for people to hear is we get caught, like we get to this end and it just gets hard because like, oh, it just feels like it's so hard. Why does it have to be so hard? And we're trying to course correct all the time. And, and then we self-sabotage. Yes. Right? Yes. Oh, the self-sabotage. I really want to talk about self-sabotage. Self-sabotage is really not sabotage. It's really self-soothing. And so we're, when you're at this part and things feel really hard, you're just trying to make yourself feel better. And so women get so caught up in this. And so you're actually doing the right thing. You're trying to make yourself feel better. And that's natural. So you know, what happens is we just decide that, you know, we're going to eat because we're trying to feel better because we're hungry or sick of green beans or whatever we're eating and we're just going to eat, but we're really just trying to make ourselves feel better. So if you can reframe that and you can pause, like we talked about before the cookies start going into your mouth and you can say, okay, I'm missing something. I'm trying to feel better. I feel bad. Something's off right? So the, the thing that's going to make me right now feel better, that sugar high or whatever it is, five minutes later, I'm going to feel horrible. Yeah. So what can I do? What is my internal wisdom telling me to do that can make me feel better right now that doesn't involve that external force, right? So can I go for a walk? Can I call my mom? Can I call my sister? Um, can I go play with my dog outside? What's going to make me feel better? instead of taking me down that opposite road. So yeah. this is another thing I want women to understand. Give yourself some grace around that moment. It's just natural, mm -hmm. but just try to, instead of, you know, breaking it or white knuckling it, modify that reaction, push pause and do something that can, you know, fill your cup. And maybe it's reading a book. Maybe it's a meditation. I don't know. Maybe my mom paints. She, she goes and paints to make herself feel better. Mm -hmm. So whatever that is, like find that and do that thing. Take five minutes to do that thing. Yeah. I always do the bird's eye view of my life. Like if I find that I'm eating too much sugar and I, and I, it gets out of control sort of thing where I'm eating, needing something sweet every day kind of thing. And that happens for me. I always know it's the big picture and I'm too stressed out. I'm working too much. My, my stress is high. It always drives me to eat sugar. And so for some, it might be emotions. It might be something else. But for me, it was always stress. Yeah. And I need to say, okay, what I need to shift something larger. Like I need to like slow down somewhere else, you know, not work as much, take the weekend, or go on vacation, whatever it is. But I try and do that like bird's eye view of overall what's happening. Like, I think I'm too stressed. It's maybe not in the moment. It's just an overall, it's too, too much stress. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Your awareness of that's wonderful. I mean, most people don't stop to have that awareness. So yeah. just even pausing to have that awareness of what it is that you need in that yeah. moment. 
Yeah. And likely it's not a cookie. Yeah. <laughs> Probably not. Or a box. Really good in the moment, but yeah. <laughs> something else. So tell everyone where they can find you. Oh, <laughs> and, what, and what it is that you do too. Like you specifically, do you do one-on-one? You have a group membership too or? Yeah. So um, my zone of genius is one-on-one. I, I love being able to dive in with people and, and really create a beautiful um, program that's going to help people just be empowered and live their best life. So um, I do fitness and nutrition coaching. That is my job now. I'm online 100%, and they can find me at fitlud. It's F-I-T-L-U-D.com. It's just me, so I do my own emailing, and it's fitlud at gmail.com. And then also um, on Facebook, I have a group that's free. It's called a thrive tribe and I go on every, you know, I'm I'm there almost every day giving tips, tricks. um, So it's a fun way to connect with me, but um, I do have a group program, although um, it's not, I really love the one-on-one more. Yeah. Yeah. Just talk about that then. (laughs) I know I I actually now like the group coaching more than the one-on-one. So I'm obviously, yeah. (laughs) No, I really like diving in with people. I really, that's awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much. That was great. I think you've probably really connected with a lot of listeners here today. Good. I hope I did. And I just, I'm so honored that you invited me to come on and speak to your audience. So thank you.